Yankee yeah. Stadium. Three game series against the Sox. So this Tom series with Drew is Pomerantz going to on the be field today. Is a show. You told You're me I'm wasting train, my time three bucks. by even bringing me here. Every single time that you guys bring me here, it's a so waste of my time. Oh! 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 Garrett Cole just wrapped up his 2023 A.L. Cy Young winning campaign with a complete game shutout in Toronto. He was his usual amazing self all year long. He finishes 15-4, and four, a 2.63 ERA, 2 earned 22 strikeouts, a whip below one. You just can't ask for more than what this guy does every fifth day. This guy, oh my Holy god, shit. Giancarlo so Stanton owns Fenway has, Park. Adam Adovino, thank you. We're paying Adam Adovino tonight to give up bomb to the Yankees. He has full cocks. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, or the hell you're listening to this. You're listening to The Cutting Edge with Jack Knife, part of the Fat Unflag Nerds Talking Sports Podcast, the sports pod with dad bods. And I got another guest with me this week, and maybe the biggest, arguably the biggest guest we've ever had on this show. Everyone, Hubs from Barstool Sports. Hubs, how you doing? What's happening, man? Long time to see. Um... Yeah, I don't know if I've ever been the biggest guest on any show, so uh, we, you're going to have to top that very soon because <laughs> I can't be the biggest guest on any show. But, uh, yeah, no, good to be here um, and excited to talk. Absolutely. I mean, for those of you who are wondering, how the hell did I get Hubs on my show? Well, it's real simple. Hubs and I both grew up to, in Menalpin, New Jersey. We went to elementary school together. We went to middle school together. We even played Little League together. And if anyone was going to make it on the Barstool Sports, I think everyone our age would be like, yeah, it's Hubs. Because <laughs> when we went to we went to school together at Lafayette Mills Elementary School, and, you know, they did the morning announcements with all the little kids. They read the news that say once that they're serving lunch ladies for at lunch day. But every Friday, Eric would, you know, Update everyone with sports, with the Yankees football. I remember Mr. Reed to this day saying, and with sports, here's Eric. <laughs> yeah, that's a good memory. Uh, I kind of wish I still had the tapes from that because uh, my fiance, once I told her once and she was very excited. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was crazy. Mr. Reed, fourth grade, uh, I went up to him and kind of told him like, hey, like, this is pretty boring. You're like news broadcast. Like, can we add some sports to it? And he's like, do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah. And then, I, yeah, I started Fridays, and I think I expanded Mondays and Fridays, and people loved it because it wasn't about, like, PTA meetings. Um, and that was kind of my start. And then they wouldn't let me do it in middle school because they wanted to make it really quick. And then high, by then in high school, like, I was just out of it. And then I kind of almost, like, gave up on the whole sports media dream. Um, we'll get to that and, in a little bit. Yeah, I wrote, up, wrote a few things in college and – Found my way ass backwards into this job. Uh, but yeah, the morning announcements, Lafayette, four through six grade, that was fun. That was a good time. Yeah, we and we were Little League teammates in seventh grade, if I remember correctly. That's kind of when I fell out of love of playing with baseball. But fall of 2006, I do have one at bat against you. I drew a walk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because okay, I sometimes I lose my control. So that's fair. 
I was playing for the Mariners. Yeah, my dad would always scream like, "Just throw strikes!" I'm like, "It's it's hard to throw strikes sometimes." So yeah, I don't know. Um, that's funny. It's good memory. I do not have that good of a memory. It's it's not your fault. I had a I had a great eye at the plate, and you just feared that I'd put the ball in the plate. I'm I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, what's it like work? <laughs> Okay, just a couple quick questions about your job. What's it like working at Barstool? How did you end up there? Yeah, no, this place is great. It's a dream. It's going to be seven years at the end of this month. Something like that? Yeah. Or maybe I already passed seven years. I forget. Um, but I went to Syracuse, uh, and there I kind of did – I wasn't into, like, the top journalism program and – Things weren't going great, and I was homesick a little bit. And then I started writing for a few, you know, like college websites, uh, nothing official. And then I didn't have a good GPA. I didn't have a good major, really. Um, took a, um, like, a $50,000, like, base pay cold calling job out of school just to have some money in my pocket. Um, I was still living at home. Did that for about four months. It was, like, the worst job I could possibly imagine. Um, I wouldn't recommend to anybody. In fact, some people still reach out to me this day and like, hey, I heard you work in this place. And I steer them away because it's that bad. Um, and then Barstool was moving to New York City. They were all, you know, before that, before 2016, they were all over the place remote, like, you know, D.C., New York, some people in Texas, uh, mm-hmm. Chicago, Philly. Like, and then finally, like, they got um, they got this this deal from Chernin uh, Media Group to you know, a large investment to get a, a central office in New York City. So then they started to get summer interns and all that. And I I, I wasn't cut out for that. I don't think I could stand out much. Um, I'm just not like I'm 150 pounds, and just a normal looking guy. And I'll maybe make you laugh one one time a day. So I was like, I, I was too intimidated to, to do the actual internship internship search. But um I noticed K Marco was the new editor in chief and I had liked his writing and stuff and he wasn't looking for an intern. So I basically emailed him and was like, Hey, you, I saw you're doing, you know, you got a lot more on your plate now. Like how can I help you? Like, I, I want to be a part of this in any way. And, you know, I don't need to get paid right away, which is the classic line. And, you know, you work, you, you just see what can happen. You just get your foot in the door in any way. So I did that for six months. Um, you know, he brought me in for an interview and all that. And it he said I was overqualified for what I was asking to do. And I just wanted to do something there and just get myself in the office. And then that way I can, you know, find things that can make me valuable. Um, and six months later, I was part-time a year after that I was full-time and then, you know, the rest is history. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a lot about finding any opportunity you can. That's awesome. And I know how you feel like the whole job after college thing. I mean, I, I'm not going to like, you know, measure which was worse. But I remember after I graduated college, I was one of the, I was working road constructions. I was one of those guys with the stop and slow sign whenever they had to close the lane on the road that I did that up until I got my job at ESPN. And then I told you before we recorded how that went off the rails, but yeah, one one more question about Barstool before we get into our beloved Yankees. There's a lot of cool things you've probably done there. What's, what do you think is the coolest you've done so far? Huh? Um, I don't know from when we did the short porch, like that was just so much fun, like going down to Tampa, like for work and like witnessing spring training and interviewing Yankees and just like getting to know these guys. Like there's definitely some really cool things I've done in this place. Um, but biased as a Yankee fan, you know, growing up my whole life, like that, like sitting down with John Sterling when he's like five feet away from me or no, less than five, five inches away from me. Like that was, it was surreal. Um, you know, like the voice of, the Yankees my entire life in the car and like I'm just sitting next to this guy and and then he's complimenting us afterwards and saying he he didn't know what he was getting into and they had a great time and that was that was surreal and you know talking to other Yankees there we interviewed Tyler Wade in the barbershop down there while he was getting his hair cut so it was a good time man uh we did that for a few years um and then yeah uh, I mean all the people we interviewed on the short porch over the years were just bucket list type things for me like it's just crazy so um, yeah, the, the run we have with the short porch with, with their interviews and guests and, and getting, getting to go down to spring training for work, all that I think was pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, the short porch is my go-to Yankees podcast whenever I'm doing things at work, but anyway, speaking of the Yankees, let's get into it because you know, we're, we're talking baseball this episode, uh, hockey season started two days ago. I wanted to talk about the Yankees before I go into 
full Rangers mode. And it seems like, you know, we missed the playoffs. We finished what 82 and 80, if I remember correctly, like what yep. second to last in the AL East. It, it seems like the Yankees have so many problem areas, which area do you, they need to address first? Balance in the lineup. Um, it's every year. It's the same old, you know, they haven't addressed left field shortstop. Yeah. Volpe could be the answer. Um, but you know, it's it, shortstop's been an issue for quite some time. And it's really just like the lack of lefties in the lineup. I wrote a blog today about, I was going to say, and it's just like, it's crazy to look back at 09 and the balance they had and how many lefties or switch hitters they had and guys who could attack the short porch, which was quite literally designed for left-handed power hitters. And, you know, we we were doing it in 09 and we've gotten so far away from it. And you look at the lineup today, this this year and, and even the lineup heading into that 2018, 2019 off season where Harper was available. It's like Greg Bird was their best left-handed hitter. Like, what are you doing? So to me, it's balanced in the lineup. And, you know, Judge kind of referenced it a little bit, um, how they value certain things over others. And I think he was talking about batting average. And obviously that's become an archaic stat. But I think it's a little, like, disingenuous to just dismiss batting average because I got to get hits. Like, you just got to get hits. And this – whatever the, – they've obsessed over launch angle – and three true outcome for the longest time. And it's just got to stop. So you got to get more balance. And they did, they have tried a little bit, you know, Ben and acquisition was ideally like the perfect kind of guy. Obviously he has his hand injury, um, you know, Rizzo type of guy for contact disaster of a 2023, obviously. Um, so, I mean, just got to keep going with that, keep going with more balance, more, more contact and all that. And that gets you in the right direction. They need other help too, with starting pitching, of course. And, <laughs> you know, philosophy and looking at the wrong analytics. But I think it, if you can address balance in the lineup correctly, that gets in, the, in a much better direction. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it makes it makes sense how Cashman does not fill his lineup with guys who are basically designed to hit in that ballpark. Like, I hate to, like, compare the Red Sox being – Compares to the Red Sox being the Yankee fan I am, but hell, there's a reason why their minor league parks are shaped basically exactly like Fenway Park. They want hitters that are designed to hit at Fenway Park. But yeah. anyway, I'm not sure what's more embarrassing. Anthony Rizzo being tr- trotted out there for months with a concussion, especially egregious now, cons- considering what we know now about concussions compared to years ago, or the fact that our young stud Anthony Volpe was struggling at the plate at one point and he got help not from the hitting coach but our minor league catcher at the time over a chicken parm dinner yeah uh, I'll still say Rizzo uh, but the Volpe thing is tough and it did lead to someone literally getting fired um, and the first basically mid-season firing they've ever done with a coach um, just does not happen with the Yankees the Rizzo thing is inexcusable and they, you know they tried to cover it up as much as they could and Rizzo gave some nice quotes to the athletic I didn't buy it for a second. Um, I think it was completely mishandled. It's it's dangerous what they did with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, he told them countless times. And, and and the fact that like they they kept saying like he's fully healthy and like he's gonna come around and the numbers just got worse and worse. To, like cr- like there's no reason for that drop off. Like he's he's just not that bad of a hitter at his age, especially how he looked early in the year. Early in the year, he looked great. His OPS plus was in like the 130s, 140s. He was excellent to start the year. Yeah. So it's... for them to just see all of that and not be like, hey, let's be sure this isn't a concussion. Like like a few months, like a month later, let's be sure. Maybe our initial tests are wrong, but the brain works in funny ways. And, you know, injuries to the brain can develop a little later than like normal, than to yeah. other injuries. And the fact that they just didn't continuously run tests on this dude is, it just, so befuddling and so concerning and it's just a microcosm of how lost the whole franchise is that like they're this oblivious to obvious things that the whole fan base was saying so i go with that absolutely and aaron boone is coming back unfortunately i mean aaron judge speaks very highly of him what the hell do we even make of that yeah no i i think hal has made it pretty clear that boone's job is safe as long as he's under contract and the players like him, as long as he didn't lose the clubhouse. And it seems to me the players love him. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, he's not in charge of necessary lineup, lineup construction or any, you know, much of anything. Bullpen probably is his main thing and motivating players. I think he does a horrible job at both of those aspects. And I would have had him gone years ago. I do shrug my shoulders that he's coming back because he's not really the problem right now. Like the problem is Brian Cash. Like if they were to just fire Aaron Boone and just, you know, that's it. That's our move. That does nothing for me. I'd still be very upset because there are so many, like he's not the issue. He's, he's, he's part of the problem, but he's not the main problem. He's not even close to the main problem. The main problem is what we we talked about before roster construction, lineup balance, you know, inability to stay healthy, like all the, like, and, you know, addressing injuries and then their reluctance to call up young guys when they should, those are issues. The Aaron Boone stuff is an issue and he's definitely lost them playoff games in the past. But to me, I'm not going to like freak out that he's coming back, although he should have been gone years ago. So it's almost like it's fighting a war that like it's not worth wasting energy on because there's bigger, bigger battles to pick. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you got to wonder like how much of that is, you know, coming down from Cashman in a sense. Like personally, I never I wouldn't have fired Joe Girardi. I mean, my co-host Zach Daniels, you know. He hated Joe Girardi. He's a big Phillies fan, but honestly, I would have taken Joe Girardi back in the heartbeat. Say what you will about the ALDS game two against the Indians, but he completely redeemed himself in the games games after that. I mean, yeah, I guess... No, for sure. The, and especially with Girardi, like, that kind of ended the era with the Yankees of managers being managers. Mm-hmm. Like... Now they're puppets. You know, like Cashman, te- the front office tells him what to do, the analytics, all this. Girardi kind of just managed. Um, I'm sure he took advice from Cashman and all that. For the most part, like, that was him. Um, he was too hard on his guys. He was too hard on Gary Sanchez, in their opinion. Um, and then they went in the complete opposite direction. And now it seems like, at least from these reports, that the message is going to be, Boone, you need to be more like Girardi. You can, st- like, create a hybrid. You're being too soft. You got to get on these guys. Mm-hmm. So... Listen, if that's the case, then that would be a good thing because I think accountability is a is a is a major issue with this team. You know, you see Glaber Torres have a terrible error in the field, you know, a, a mislapse with his brain, or you know, a terrible base running error with Higashioka going from second to third and a ground ball hits the shortstop's right side. Like that happens so many times. And then and where like, you know, anything Donaldson would do where he'd pimp out a single, like or you know, that should have been a double. Pimp yeah, he would do nothing. He stares like, at a freaking what he thinks is a home run, but it's caught on the warning track. Right. So like, but there would be no accountability when they get back to the dugout. So like, I think that shit's got to change immediately. Like that has to be the message. And um, it's frustrating, man. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I was happy when Girardi, when Girardi was moved on from, but I obviously assumed they were going to go in a much better direction. Um, you know, and, and then Bo- and maybe I was even a little excited for Boone, but you don't know what you're getting into. You just see Boone on the TV and you're like, Oh, that guy's, enter- that guy's, you know, charismatic and he seems to know what he's talking about, but like, you don't know what's going on. Like when he's actually going to be a manager for the first time in his life. So um, yeah, it's frustrating as hell, man. It, it really is. Um, but when it come back to the Boone thing, like I really just, I shrug my shoulders. It's not, it's not something I get mad about. The other stuff is what I get mad about. Yeah. I mean, to compare to, you know, to go back to the New York Rangers, like at the end of last season, players were literally telling, you know, the GM and whatnot, they were asking for help because their coach at the time, Gerard Gallant, really didn't coach. But it sounds like, it, at the very least, the players like Aaron Boone. So part of me wonders, if Cashman's gone and, you know, maybe they are able to like let him manage? Okay, I'm totally open to changing my mind on that. But with this this window, this competitive window, that seemed to have started with the Baby Bombers back in 2017, at what moment do you think it kind of began to go downhill in your opinion? Um, 2021. I feel like 2021 things really took a nosedive because 2019, that team should have won the World Series. That team was so good. Um, they ran into Garrett Cole. Like they ran into the Houston Astros. And what they do, they the Yankees go and get Garrett Cole. So it's like that's the missing piece. Mm-hmm. But like it's it almost seemed like they went and got Cole. And then everything kind of stopped. Like they stopped caring about every, everything else. They just assumed Cole was going to push them over the mountain. But like he still needed to help out a little bit with the rest of the roster. And then they got really lazy. And then they 
got two pot committed to contracts that they had signed to these guys, like an Aaron Hicks, who should have been moved on from way before he was actually moved on from, um, you know, and then they started to get too cute with the payroll that, and that's somehow stuff, obviously, but you know, the shortstop class comes and goes with Seager, Simeon, all these guys. They don't even meet with Seager who was destined to, he, he's just perfect Yankee. Like, I don't know if it would have ever happened if they actually sat down with him, but, and he signed for a lot of money with Texas, but man, a lefty power hitter, shortstop. I like Anthony Volpe. I think he'll be good, but Seager was meant for, meant like for this park and to be on this team. He just looks like a Yankee. So, um, yeah, it's frustrating, man. I, I don't really know the exact – I can't exactly pinpoint it, but I say 2021, um, it was just, you know, getting embarrassed by the Red Sox. Cole shows up with, like, the torn hamstring that they don't talk about. Um, 2020, it's like – I almost just – I mean, you wish COVID didn't happen, right? Because, you know, th- those games were played in San Diego. You don't get the true Yankee environment there. They were he- they were neck and neck with Tampa in that series. Yeah, You know, they just – Blew it in game, uh, you know, Chapman or whatever. And and then the game two debacle with Debbie Garcia, like just trying to outsmart themselves. Um, so you can pinpoint a lot of things, I guess. But for me, it's 2021 is when things really took a nose up because I felt in 2019, they were very close. Like that team was just so good. And maybe I had to do a juice ball era and all that. DJ hits, you know, his he has his insane year. Glaber has almost 40 homers. 2019, I just look back at that team more than even 2017. I'm just like, man, how did this team not win the World Series or even get to the World Series? The answer is the Houston Astros. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, it's the same. Cashman says, I think it was Cashman who said the playoffs are a crapshoot. Well, I think that the Astros just went to the ALCS for, like, what, the seventh year in a row, if yep. I remember correctly? Yep. That's that's in, that's insane to me how you could still have that mentality. Now, yeah, here- I hope I'm hoping this offseason is a wake up call to stop that and how regular season games in April and May do matter. You can't just punt those games away. And like if you're going for a sweep and, and Judge did hit on this. Judge has said so many right things in the last month. Like I, I'm, I'm so he's like almost speaking for the fan base. It feels like. Uh, yeah. like the only thing he's not said is like fire Cashman. Everything else he basically is just a fan because he's basically said like when they're going for the sweep in April and May, and then they rest guys. It's like, why? The Braves played their guys 100. And I'm, listen, the Braves could get eliminated in a few hours. But in the regular season, they were unbelievable. And they built this team. And they played all their main guys 155, 158 games. Maybe even all. I forget. Some people probably played the whole season. So um, it's just a lack of urgency throughout the whole organization. That is the That is the biggest way to sum up this entire franchise's problem, lack of urgency. Right. Now here's, here's where I think it kind of like began to, it wasn't like the lowest of lows, but I feel like this is when it started and feel free to say like, Jack, you're fucking crazy for thinking this. Mm-hmm. But I honestly think it was when we got Stanton, we didn't need him. And you touched on this on the blog you put out today. How many righty power hitters do you need in a stadium? That's favorable to left-handed hitters. I think that's something yeah, you, you touched up on that today. After 2017, they didn't need to make to add more power hitting to their lineup. They just need to make some tweaks. They relied so much on hitting home runs, this go big or go home mentality that hitting for contact or just trying to get on base and advance base runners just doesn't seem like a concept to them now. Like I think back to that game, I think it was last year against Seattle, two, two innings in a row with the ghost runner. Only two batters came out to the plate because they were so bad at Bass base running. I mean, just look at the batting averages on some of these guys currently on the roster. I mean, for example, the Yankee, the Yankees of the nineties hit a lot of home runs, but they also knew how to get on base and play small ball when necessary. Mm-hmm. But back to Stanton in six seasons, he's played 549 games. If he played all 162 games, I probably would be like in the upper nine hundreds. I'm not asking him to play all of the, obviously I'm not crazy. So he's missed a little less than half of the games due to injury. They thought they brought in this guy to be a part of their core and half the time he's hurt. Hell, he even played hurt. I don't remember which game it was, but I'm sure you saw the way he ran and got thrown out at home that one time. He was basically walking to the plate and then got tagged out. That's not to say he hasn't had his moments here. He's got 135 home runs since arriving, but I don't think that was the move the Yankees needed to make. That was just a move the Yankees made just because they could. Well, 
I'll counter it in saying when the Yankees traded for Stanton and you look at what they gave up at the time, I was, I was elated. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. And you want to talk about a guy who isn't for average or whatever. The year before he came over, he was a 281 hitter with a thousand OPS and 59 home runs with the Marlins. So you thought you were getting that guy. Yeah. Like, and I don't care if he's right or lefty. If you win the MVP and you put up those numbers, I want you on my team. Um, now, no one could for, no one could have foreseen that only at 33 years old, what he's, he's about to be 34, that his body's this broken down already. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he can't play the field. And that was a big issue, too, is they DH'd him too much, I felt like. And, yeah. I mean, that's not even I felt like. I know they DH'd him too much. I'm glad you brought that up because that's something I neglected to mention because I did notice there is a huge noticeable difference between Giancarlo San when he's in the field and when he's just a DH. Yeah, and, it's, they, and it, that goes back to them not knowing how to manage a guy's health and injuries. Um, now, obviously, with the Marlins, he was forced to play the field because the DH National wasn't League. a thing back then, right? Mm-hmm. But, man, the numbers when he plays the field and when he DHs are staggering. And his the way he keeps his body healthy are staggering when he plays the field rather than DH. Like, he's talked about countless times. Like, he, he keeps his muscles loose and all this. And I think, listen, he, he definitely does. I don't know what he's going to change his offseason, but he's going to have to switch up some sort of fitness schedule, fitness program he's got going on. and just generate more flexibility because he's, he's just, he's a statue up there. Um, is there more to him? He still hit 24 home run, home runs this year, you know, 191 batting average. That is, that just can't happen. You know, almost a 700 OPS, like from John Carlos Stan, that can't happen. This guy needs to meet 800 OPS guy at his age. Like he can't be, can't be sub 700. That's insane. Um, but yeah, of course, in hindsight, you go back to that trade and you're like, yeah, that in their eyes clogged up, uh, the, the the payroll enough that they couldn't pursue a Harper, a Manny Machado. Yeah. And that sucks. So if you go back, of course you redo that trade. But at the time, that's all hindsight 2020 because you're getting a guy who's in 281 in the prime of his hitting career, 100, 132 RBIs, a 59 homer guy, the MVP of the National League. So like it's tough to really like regret it because at the time everyone, people were going nuts. And this is coming off 2017 where all the kids – make this run a year or two early and they get within a game of the world series. And now you're adding Stan and it's like, wow, they, they not only they believe in this roster and this, and these young kids, they were now adding this guy on top of this and they didn't give up anything for him. So mm-hmm. it's just tough to, it's, it just sucks. The whole way it plays out absolutely sucks. Do I regret it? I mean, I do regret it. Of course, if I could go back, I wouldn't do it. But at the time, there's no one in the no Yankee fan in the world that was upset they traded for John Carlos Stanton. It's just a lie. You just aren't. All right. Not was well, I guess, Yeah, I remember like the, leading up to that season, I would see commercials for the Michael K show, and you know it would show you know like this little <clears> cartoon <throat> talking about how great you know the Yankees lineup was. They got Judge and Stanton, and how Gary Sanchez at the time might be the best hitter in the lineup, and that turned out to be a complete lie. But Anyway, Brian Cashman yeah. has made a lot of bad decisions. I mean, which one do you think is his worst? Personally, I think it's a toss-up between trading Urshela and Sanchez for Donaldson or trading Montgomery for Bader. That I'll always say, and I said in the blog, it's not sitting down and meeting with Bryce Harper. Oh, to not okay. sign him is one thing. To not even meet with the guy who is outspoken, loves the Yankees, and would fit perfectly in the lineup and just looks like a Yankee wanted to be, he would, he would, he would accept the culture. He would thrive in it. He would love a city like New York, just like he does Philadelphia. Yeah. He would, he would embrace himself here. Like the, he just the, the number one person, like a, like a fuck you personality like to the Red Sox he would have had. And to not meet with that guy and to blame it on the six outfielders that they had, Four of them being Aaron Hicks, Jacoby Ellsbury, Clint Frazier, and Brett Gardner. Mm -hmm. That's what stopped you. Those quotes will live on forever. As long as it takes for them to win their next World Series, you will keep. And as many times I got to see Bryce Harper hitting bombs for the Phillies in the postseason and send that city into an earthquake, like those will live on for as long as the Yankees don't win their next World Series. And then all this gets reset because that is such an unbelievably glaring mistake and error that it's screwed them all up and to blame it on maybe extend clogging it like that. You could have made everything work like you mm-hmm. just could have. And if you look at Harper's contract, he is so under market value per with his AAV 
yeah, he's going for a long, uh, it, you know, it's quite a lengthy contract, but he gets paid like $25 million. Josh Donaldson was making that. Mm-hmm. So, and, and obviously the Donaldson trades a, a Travis in itself. And um, I feel like they threw in Urshela there just so I think they were just trying to get rid of San- Sanchez at that point. No, he, correct. They, they, instead of non tendering Gary, they, Cashman's ego forced him to go get something for Cashman. He had to, he couldn't just, he couldn't just discard Gary, despite all his failures and his, you know, his time in New York was up, clearly. He yeah. had to go get something else. He's the catcher and, who couldn't catch. Right. And, you know, he has a Cashman, one of Cashman's biggest flaws, and he's got a lot of them, is he does not like to admit mistakes. That's why it yeah. took so long to get rid of Aaron Hicks. That's why it took so long to get rid of Gary. Mm-hmm. Brett Gardner. Like, the you know, the years of counting on Brett Gardner to play left field at an MLB level. Well, not defensively, offensively. He wasn't an off. He could do, still do it defensively. Um, there's a lot of lot of mistakes, man. You can go down the list. Um, we'll see what's happening with Carlos Rodon here. The Sonny Gray trade. It, I guess at least they didn't give up anything there. Like, it, that's the only saving grace here is he really doesn't trade away prospects who become stars. But, man, there's a lot of whiffs out there. But not even meeting with Bryce Harper will always live with me. And – it always comes out around this time because Bryce Harper's in the playoffs doing some cool stuff. Uh, yeah. Let's just look at the fucking game three against the Braves. He was unbelievable. And he does it all the time. He always shows up, lives for big moments. He was born to be a Yankee. And Brian Cashman said no. Yeah. And he, he, like you said, he has that fuck you attitude. Like both of those home runs, he stared down the Braves shortstop. I forgot the shortstop. Orlando name. Arcia. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, he wasn't even supposed to hear that, but like that extra motivation. But you know that gave Harper that extra motivation. But yeah, yeah. and that that quote he Cashman said like Urshela is not Josh Donaldson. It's like okay, you'd have a point if this was like what 2014, 15 Donaldson. I forget what it was when he was yeah. you know doing great for the Blue Jays. But yeah, Cashman, I forget if he has four or five World Championships under his belt. But I think you could credit the '90s ones. For being Gene Michaels hires. I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's like I, I don't Stick know. Bro- Stick definitely in, like built that whole dynasty and Cashman just inherited it. That's it. Yeah. And I don't know how closely you follow hockey. I think you tune into the Rangers every once in a while. But like yeah. to in I know in we ho- play tonight. That's about it. Yes. Uh it's gonna be a rough start. But a rough start. We're gonna make the playoffs, but I'm getting off topic. But <laughs> uh but it's like in when the Tampa Bay Lightning won the Stanley Cup in 2020 and 2021, yeah. their, their GM at the time was Julian Breezebois. I'm not, this isn't me necessarily saying he's bad, but he won those championships primarily with guys that Steve Eiserman hired. And the 2009 World Series, when we beat the Phillies that year, that was when Steinbrenner went goblin mode because he was so angry that they didn't make the playoffs last year, the final year at Yankee Stadium. Now they're saying, you know, they're having this thorough review, but I didn't feel, I don't necessarily feel like the pissed offness from the front office. Cause um, I forget what Hank Steinbrenner put out a quote, like, you know, we're going to be dangerous next year. He was so angry. I, I just don't feel that now. He's just, Hal's just like, eh, we're going to review everything. You know? He's just not as hands-on as Hank or George were. Like he just doesn't have that mentality. Maybe this embarrassment leads to him snapping out of a little bit wishful thinking at best i'm not really getting my hopes up for much here brian cashman is coming back aaron boone's coming back i i i hope they clean house with the analytics department and they you know i I think analytics are important no doubt i'm not saying like get rid of analytics but look at other analytics use them differently look how other teams use them and do it that way because the way you're doing it is so wrong so mm-hmm. that to me would be nice if they got like Michael Fishman out of there, who's the, the head analytics guy who Cashman listens to all the time. They got rid of him. I'd be ecstatic. And then I'd be like, okay, let's cook here a little bit. Now let's go get Yamamoto. Let's mm-hmm. maybe see if Juan Soto wants to get traded for it. You know, do some of those things. Cody Bellinger, what's going on with you? But I don't know. I don't know if they're willing to go to these levels and these lengths, but they need to because they're so, there's not a lot of like roster changing here. Like Stan still signed for four more years. Like there's a there's a lot of like black holes in 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 the roster that aren't really moved on from yet. Like you need another year or two to even think about that stuff. What do you do with Glaver? He's got a year left on his deal. He's had a career year basically, non non uh, juice ball era. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. There's a lot of questions, man. And I, I don't think Cashman is the right guy for it. And that terrifies me. Like, I just don't think if there's someone to get out of this, get someone to get us out of this, this, this funk. It's not him, but the only way I think to do it is the old Yankee way. And it's how snap out of it, open the checkbook and just pay your way out of this hell and pray that you get the right guys. Absolutely. That's one way to look at it now. Uh, freaking brain farting. What was I going to say when you were at eh, whatever? I'll just get into the next question. Anyway, do, do you have any faith that this core will win a world series or are they just going to be wasting judges and Cole's careers at this point? Yeah, I, I really hope not, man. Cause it'd be really sad. Um, I think the way the judges new mentality, uh, not new mentality, but more aggressive mentality now being the captain and Cole really settling in here as a Yan- an all-time Yankee, like if he keeps this up, think they get there. Um, it's going to take some magic. Um, I think it does help that the American League is softening. Um, if the Yankees were in the playoffs this year, they could have easily went to the World Series, even how bad they were. Like, they, they, it was wide open. For the first time ever. I know Houston's back in the ALCS, right? But they're not, they're still not their dominant self. Like the Rangers are going to give them hell. And the Rangers are great, obviously. But the Orioles are frauds. The Blue Jays are frauds. The Twins are whatever. The Twins are the Twins. You probably saw. If they just, if, and if you also think about it, the Yankees still somehow won 82 games. And I, I hope like they don't see that and be like, oh, we only need a little bit more. But, like, you're not far away from being a 95-win team again. You just aren't. If, it, with all the issues they had, they had so many issues this year, and they won 82 games. They were they were two wins less than the Diamondbacks, who were in the NLCS. Wow. It doesn't take – they're not so far away. They're still – they got to change things. But if you think of – seemingly everything went wrong this year for them, and they still won 82 games. So there's a foundation there to be really good again really quickly. Things have to go that break their way. Carlos Rodon has to pitch like we're paying him. That's that's that would be massive, especially if they go get a Yamamoto, right? To be the definitive number two. And all of a sudden Rodon snaps in as snaps out of it and becomes the three. Then you have Clark Schmidt, you have Michael King. That's a really good rotation. Really good. And you still have young guys and Will Warren and Chase Hampton in the minor leagues. So um there's hope, man. Um, but for me, you have to address the lineup like we started the show with. I think the pitching could sort its way out, and maybe you have to go get go get a Yamamoto. Sure, no brainer type of guy to go get, but they got to address the lineup. They haven't done it in years, and they got to do it now. Yeah, and I remembered what I was going to say, but you know, the it's no, it seems like no one really cares that much about batting average anymore. I mean, it, Tommy Smoke said it on an episode like maybe a year or so ago. It's like, why don't you people care that much about batting? Average. That's literally how many times you get a freaking base hit. But yeah, th- I just want to get that out there. Yeah, I no, remember. contact's important, man. You gotta put the you gotta. It's a way to score runs. Is contact. Yeah, it just it's, There's yeah. a balance. There's a balance to it. It's just some people go to the extreme and they completely discount batting average. Like it's still an important stat. Yeah, it's Derek... not an end all be all stat. OPS is important too, man. So is on base percentage. Those are all. The, the, it's a reason they're all part of the, the three slashes slugging on base and batting they're all important yeah like Derek Jeter like he wasn't a power hitter he he got on he got on base he was the leadoff hitter like pe- pe- people like to criticize Jeter in the sense like oh he doesn't have that many RBIs he didn't drive in that many runs I'm like well Jeter was job wasn't to drive in runs he his job was to get on base and be the run if you know right. what I mean but right. It's a damn, sh- but like with this core, it's a damn shame because despite Judge missing all the time he did, he still hit over 30 home runs. Yeah. Cole is basically a lock for the Cy Young Award, AL Cy Young Award, but nobody's talking about that. Nobody's talking about either of those two things. Yankee fans don't care about individual accomplishments. They want championships. Now there yeah. were, now, now the organization was worried about luxury taxes while also giving a lot of money to guys like Donaldson, Hicks. Sure, they're still near the top of the league in payroll, but the idea that the Yankees are afraid to spend money is something I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. I'm convinced yeah. that – go on. You were going to say something? No, I, I I think it's valid, and sometimes they, they prevent themselves from going after someone because of that. 
Mm-hmm. They still spend a lot of money. It's just spent not in the right ways. places. A hundred percent. And that yeah. goes on Cashman. But like, like I'll knock Hal, but my bigger gripe is with Cashman because for 250 plus million dollar payroll, you should be putting out a better product. Like just point blank. Yes. And, and better product doesn't even sell it. Like you should be putting out a way better product. You should be winning 95 games minimum with a $250 million payroll. And he yes. doesn't even come close to it because of the way he spends his money. So yeah, that that's an issue. Yeah, and I'm convinced that Hal only paid Judge because he knew that's the only way he'll get asses in the seats at yeah, Yankee well, Stadium. Yeah, it was it was a move they had to make. Yeah, because quite literally could not. They, you have to take out the judges' chambers in right field. You know, you know what kind of visual that would have been if you had the and and he's playing into an opening day for the Giants. Like that was a move you just had the and and, and it's the right move. Like it, it, it's not going to be questioned. Like you you just said it. The numbers he put up even by missing two months were crazy. That's how good he he's unbelievable. And and honestly, the people who say he's injury prone, that's just baloney. Like he ran into a concrete slab. And yeah, that, that wasn't a non-contact he, injury. He literally he caught his wrist the wall. And when he broke his wrist, he had a uh, a Royals pitcher hit him with a fastball 96 miles an hour and broke his wrist. Like, all right, what do you want him to do? Like this who survives that? Like no one. Like he's only had like a few little like muscle situations but nothing like too severe his biggest injuries have been freak injuries yeah yeah like i said to go back on the putting asses in the seats guess what isaiah kind or falafa is not doing that however no. maybe just maybe there is some hope with some of the these new baby bombers that are coming up anthony volpe jason dominguez when he gets healthy and you know in Austin Wells there might be some names I'm forgetting you did mention a couple prospects that you know I'm not that familiar with yeah yeah no there dude it sucks that Jason Dominguez went down when he did um mm-hmm. and we are, you're not going to get him till July if we get him back in July though that could be a nice little jolt assuming you address things things in the offseason um I like what I saw out of Austin Wells to end the year um started slow with him but he really looked like okay we can get offense out of a catcher and he Held him, held his own. He didn't catch Cole, but he held his own defensively, and has a pretty good arm. Like for what we were feared, we were like he can't play at all. That's what we were told. Mm-hmm. Looks totally fine to me. Um, we'll see what Everson Pereira. I think they messed with his swing a little bit. Hopefully, they get that back on track in the off season. Um, you know, Oswaldo Cabrera kind of is what he is. He had a little bit of a hot streak at one point. Volpe's Volpe. I think Volpe will will be fine. I'm not really worried too much about Volpe. If the rest of the team performed the way they did, I think they would help them a lot. But with everyone struggling and Judge being out, that really puts so much pressure on the kid that just like he already had enough pressure on him. And then mm-hmm. you take Judge out of the equation for two months and they hit the slide they did, he had no chance. Mm-hmm. Um, great that he looked as good defensively as he did, though. Like that's such a surprise. Like we didn't really know we were, you know, we were told Oswald Peraza is the best defensive guy, and that may be very true. But Volpe really held his own, and that's exciting. Um, and, yeah, Peraza had a very good September as well. Good for him. I don't know where he fits in this team moving forward when you have DJ and Glaber and, and Volpe in the equation. We'll have to find out. That could be an offseason answer. Um, but, yeah, I, I like the young guys. I do. I, I think they can help big time. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that talk about the Aaron Judge injury, what it meant to Anthony Volpe, like that kind of reminds me of, Aaron Rodgers going down what it meant to Zach Wilson, but on a much lesser level. But um, yeah, I think that could, just about does it for the Yankees talk. Onto the playoffs in general. Of all the teams remaining, anyone in particular you're rooting for, or just you Phillies? Know? Phillies. I want Harper to get his ring. Yeah, and I obviously I, want the I want the Rangers to beat the Astros. Um, well, yeah, I'm just tired of Houston. Um, I, I don't I don't really have a scorn hatred for them anymore. I'm just just over it. Like I I just res- almost like kind of respect them at this point. Like. It's amazing that they their the sustainability they have. That's something I strive for um, with this team. Um, but Texas is so cool, and the way they just mashed the ball and the way they just obliterated the Orioles was just so impressive. And now you might be getting Scherzer back, probably getting Scherzer back. Montgomery's on the team, pitching in big games. Good for him. Happy for Jordan. It was always just a nice guy to us. Um, and obviously on the other side, the Phillies. I, Arizona is a great story. In terms of juice, though, I want Bryce Harper in the World Series. That'd be very cool. Again. Yeah, I agree. I think, I mean, Astros hatred aside, like, I think it would be nice to see the 
Texas Rangers win, considering they've never won a World Series before. I always like to see a new champion. However, like I'm with you, I'm kind of rooting for the Phillies, not not necessarily for my co-host, Zach, the big Phillies fan he is, but because it is kind of a middle finger to Cashman, considering Bryce Harper wanted to be a Yankee. Cashman chose Hicks. You see it on both sides too, though, though. Like Corey Seager, he not necessarily wanted to be a Yankee, True. but but the perfect kind of Yankee. Absolutely. And then if you see those guys are trading blows going, you know, haymaker after haymaker in the World Series, you <laughs> be like, dude, what are you doing? Like, what why was it? Did we not. So, what was it you wrote at the end of your block today? If it's a Phillies Rangers World Series, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be depressed or something along those lines. That's putting it lightly. I said something probably more severe. Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> that would be depressing. I will say though, I guess if it's Phillies Rangers for the league as a whole, that's a win because those are two teams that have spent a lot of money in the last few years, and it shows you if you spend a lot of money in the right ways and not recklessly, like the Mets. Like hmm. it produces wins. Like I know for a long, like, you know, all year, right. The Orioles were in, were in the mix. Arizona is currently in the mix. Still don't spend a lot of my Tampa one ninety something games, mm-hmm. 99 games. Um, those teams don't spend any money. So that was almost like a, you know, if you're smart enough, you can get around it. But at the end of the day, you got to spend money. So yeah. to see Philly and Texas have this much success is very good for the league's health. I think as a whole, because it shows owners, you got to spend. Yeah, absolutely. And if George Steinbrenner was still alive, I mean, assuming Cashman would even make it this far, Cashman probably would have been fired before Bryce Harper's second home run ball even landed last night. That's a fun game to play. If if he was still alive, when would he actually have been fired by now? Because he would have been fired. Yeah. So it's a fun game of what, what would a George's breaking point have been? And I don't know. There's so many. There's so many ways to go about it. Um. Maybe it's maybe it is losing that wild card game to the Red Sox the way they yeah. did after twenty one. That feels like maybe the one. Right. Maybe I would have. Maybe I also would have rooted for the Orioles if you know it wasn't for you know Aaron Hicks being on that team. Just because. Yeah, I, love, I, just, I can't I love, my own. I love. I mean, they're the only team I like. If anything, I'd have a soft spot for only because I love Camden Yards so much. Well, I I love Fenway Park too, but I despise the fucking Red Sox. But uh, and oh, speaking of Camden Yards, um. Do you remember back in 2003 when Jack Cust fell down running to home plate and Posada tagged him out for the final out to win the game? Yeah. I was at that game. I shit you not. That's awesome. That's <laughs> no, a good memory. I, I still remember it to this day. John Flaherty hitting two home runs. But anyway, Hubs, any final thoughts? No, man. Uh, this was a blast. I always like talking baseball. Um, I wish it was in a better light. Um, I hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully Hal and Cashman get their get their heads out of their asses and start doing things, man, and make serious change because otherwise I'm gonna be really sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? This might be the closest I ever come to like being on Boston. But anyway, Hubs, how don't you plug everything where people can follow you? Like any social social media handles. Yeah, my you got? Twitter's my Twitter's at Barstool Hubs. Uh Instagram is Eric underscore hubs. I'm on TikTok somewhere. I always forget to post. Um and I write blogs for Barstool that you can read under as hubs. So, yeah, a lot of hubs. You type in hubs, you'll probably find them. Yeah, whether you're listening to this on the podcast platforms or w- watching this on YouTube, you know, there will be links in the description where you can follow hubs if you don't follow already. But, Eric, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It's very cool to catch up with an old friend, but it's even more cool to see that old friend living his dream and doing great things in his career. I mean, Hopefully we can schedule something again like this in the future, maybe around the time pitchers and catchers report, you know, we'd have to get into the logistics of that. But in the meantime, yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. I'm looking forward to some more short porch podcasts from you, Tommy and Marty in the future. If you guys, you know, are looking to get that going again, like I said, that's my Yankees pot go to Yankees podcast. I'm not sure how much your appearance on this episode will help grow my show. I'm, I'm not sure how often Dave views content of his employees being on other programs, if at all. I mean, let's be honest. Um, I would guess. I would guess. Not. Yeah, I, guess not. yeah, because this this podcast is isn't even in the same galaxy as Barstool. No. I mean, uh, yeah. no, I said he just doesn't. He's. Uh, I know. But uh, no, uh, listen, man. It was it was nice to catch up for sure. Good good seeing you. Good. Uh, hopefully you're doing well and and things. You know, break your way and just keep at it, man. Uh, it's it's a grind. I know, man. Yeah, I mean, I still hold out some hope he'll see this or discover me eventually and say, like, this kid Jack is odd. 
I like him. Let's bring him on. <laughs> that's, that's how it goes sometimes, man. Yeah, I mean, that's something I said in my audition tape for the talent search like a year or two ago, but I'm sure I'm one of many to like send out an edition like that. The thing about, you know, our line of work, you know, the supply for guys like the, us is overwhelming. It's just that demand is, you know, Big time. Very, very short. Big but, time. Yeah, I haven't released my edition tape for the public. I want to, though. Maybe I'll do that next week, but... I hope you had fun coming on. I hope I impressed you, and I hope we can collaborate again in the future, all right? Absolutely, my man. Good talking to you. All right, thanks, Hubs. If you made this if you made this far, thank you very much for listening. Be sure to subscribe to us on all social medias, at Funs Podcast on Instagram and Twitter, and on Facebook, at Fat Athletic Nerds Talking Sports. This is Jack Knife alongside Hubs of Barstool Sports. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Bye.